Hey guys. I know it looks weird that I'm sitting Indian style telling this story, but I swear to God it will make sense in a few minutes. I'm not, not eccentric or anything. So, I haven't told this story in about three years, so you gotta forgive me if some of the details are a little, yeah, little uh, blurry, but this story comes in two acts, and with each act I have a keyword that I'm gonna throw out that kind of defines everything. The first act, the keyword is sterile. It's not going where you think, it's, it's very innocent. I was not about when I was a teenager. Anyway. Sterile is the best word I can use to describe the place with which this story took place. I remember there were a lot of sterile tiles that had those patterns that some autistic savant in France probably came up with a hundred years ago where it looks like Pac-Man every, every so many feet. But I remember they were sterile even though people walked on them, they were never dirty. And I remember there were sterile counters where little kids would get their medication in little sterile cups. And I remember we had sterile meals given us to us every day that were wrapped in sterile cling wrap where everything was prepackaged. And I also remember that on this sterile wall there was a sterile clock. And it had just reached 944, which means it was time for everyone to go to the rec room. And a pile of about 10 kids passed by me as I was standing still in the hallway. And I remember there was Annalisa, who was anorexic. I swear to God I didn't make that up, that actually <laughs> happened. Um, she wore a very tight gown the hospital gave to her because they didn't want to hide the fact that she was anorexic. I remember there was a kid named Bevan who chemically could not smile. He wasn't bipolar, which would make that a lot easier to remember. But And then there was a kid named Devin, and the way I can remember Devin is he was the fucking devil. <laughs> he had an ear-to-ear -ear grin and glasses and one of those Beatles bowl cut from the Ed Sullivan show. And I don't know what was wrong with him, but I think if you took the DSM-4 and shredded it and put it on a wall and threw darts at it, you could probably hit whatever it was that he had. <laughs> <laughs> but around, yeah. but around uh, it was 9.44 with about 10 seconds to spare and everybody went to the rec room. And I remember this because at exactly 9.55, I had five minutes to do 99 push-ups. That's 99 push-ups and 99 rests. And my push-ups and rests would go like this. One, two, three. Whoop. It didn't work the way I wanted to. And then I would rest. Tick one, tick two, tick three. I had to do this at exactly 9.55 and exactly every day. And so it was about 9.55, and I would do my push-ups one, two, three, and then I would rest. One, two, three, and then one, two, six, rest. One, two, three. And they had to be perfect. My back had to be completely stiff. My chest had to touch the ground exactly on the tick, because if it didn't, I knew that bad things would happen. So it was one, two, 66, rest. One, two, three, one, two, three, 69. I didn't know what that meant yet. Rest, one, two, three. And then as I was broaching 100 and I knew my day would be okay, I heard right above me, hey, John. And it was Devin with his devilish grin <laughs> saying to me, um, and Devin had a habit of saying random shit that had nothing to do with anything. I went to Vancouver once. <laughs> I was still in the middle of my, I was still making progress. One, two, 72 I guess, I don't know, I can't, <laughs> threes. And um, I just kind of listened to him as he spoke, keeping my cadence, as he told me random shit until finally I lost count and turned to him told him to move on. He gave me more reasons of why Vancouver was cool, I gave him more reasons of why I didn't care, and then he said something to me that I'll never forget coming to him, which coming from him was a huge insult, which is, you're weird. And then walking away. <laughs> but you see, in that time, my back was not straight. It started with me touching door locks when I was about seven years old. It started once, then it had to be three times, then it had to be 12 times. Then started with me touching the ground. Had to be three times, had to be nine times, had to be 27 times. 
And then after a while, it got to the point where I had to touch my chest to the floor because if I didn't, I knew that if I didn't touch my chest to the floor a certain number of times with a certain number of rests in the middle of it, maybe a plane would crash. Maybe a plane would crash, I'd see it on the news and I'd know that I was responsible. Probably wasn't, but if I didn't do this, I knew the plane was going to crash. If I didn't do it, I saw a plane crashed on the news, I could never hear the end of it in my own head. So I was down there and I had to start from scratch and I think I was up to about 21 rest one, two, three, when one of the orderlies, Peter, who worked there, slowly started to make his way by. I thought this was going to stop me, but luckily I think Peter was there in community service, so he didn't care. He just kind of walked by, gazed at me. That's one of the weird I'm going to go to the, um, I'm going to go to the rec room. And again, I was broaching 99 with three second rests in the middle when all of a sudden I heard a more soothing voice towering a lot more above me because when you're a kid everybody's 10 feet tall. I heard, hey what are we doing down there? This is Emery. Emery was the exact opposite of Peter. She wanted to be there and I think she came from about five generations of hippies. <laughs> I explained to her that I was exercising because a healthy body produces a healthy mind, which is what she taught us. And she thought that was wonderful, knowing that one of her teachings had come, had sunk in with, uh, with one of her patients. So she decided to kind of coach me along as I was broaching 100. One, two, three, rest. One, two, three. And she leaned in and said, you know, John, sometimes when I'm doing deep breathing, I say a mantra. Do you know what a mantra is? And I was like, no, she says, my favorite mantra is Ezra Town. <laughs> Ezra Town. So I would go one, two, three, rest, Ezra Town. And then get down and do three more. One, two, three. And as I was broaching a hundred, again, I could feel my back go out of whack. I could feel my t uh, knees dip, so I had to start. But Ezra, uh, I want to call her Ezra, Emery was so proud that uh, I had taken what she said to heart that she got everyone out of the rec room and surrounded them around me. And she said, we're going to follow John's lead. Everybody, when John does a push-up, I want you to do a push-up. When John rests, I want you to rest. So I had an entire hallway full of about 12 kids with various problems mimicking my one, two, three. Rest, one, two, three. When you're in a pediatric psychiatric ward, if you haven't put it all together yet, but that's where I was, um, time kind of stands still. Time kind of just flies by. It could have been two weeks later, it could have been two months later, but the main thing that I remember is on the wall next to the clock, there was a dry erase board with all of our names on it t saying how close we were to uh, being released. And I remember the day that my name was erased off there because it was my release day. At least I thought it was my release day. I packed my bags and I was excited to go back home, eat non-sterile food and play in my dirty ass backyard. But something funny happened that day. Uh, my name was put back on the board and the doctor sat down and told me that they needed to have more tests. Which means that I was stuck in this place for the unknown future, which brings us to Act 2, and the key word for this act is wire. Because I remember being in the backyard, um, well, I'm sorry, being in our play area, and looking through a wire fence, which was very much not sterile. It was twisted, and it was dirty, and it was foggy. And I remember looking through this wire fence into just the unforeseen woods. And as I looked through this, I knew that there were kids out there who were allowed to play without wire around them. I knew that there were cars in the distance, and I knew somewhere there was somebody looking at a forest just like me, but they had the option to leave whenever they wanted to. And I knew that in the back of my head, I wasn't like Annalisa, who was anorexic. I wasn't like Devin, who was fucking nuts. Or I wasn't like this other kid who couldn't smile. I was a normal kid, and I deserved normal things. So... I looked behind me and I saw Peter over in the corner doing the bare minimum and I saw Emery in another corner playing with a group of six-year-olds and something came over me and I took one hand and I grabbed that dirty wire fence. I looked behind me again and nobody had noticed so I took my other hand and I put it above that one. Then I put my next hand above that one. Then I reached up and put my hand above that one and started to lift myself off the ground. 
I looked behind me and uh, Emery and Peter had noticed that I was suspended from this fence, but they hadn't really said anything yet. So I started to pull myself up a little bit more. It was about 12 feet high. When I got three-fourths of the way up, my head about three-fourths of the way up. How am I doing on time, by the way? You're all right. All right, good. Couple, couple minutes. All right. <laughs> um, I remember um, finally hearing a little peep of Emery going, hey, John, let's take it to the swings. Let's take it to the swings. <laughs> so let's take it to the swings. <laughs> But I didn't listen to her, you know? I knew I wasn't supposed to be there, so I took another hand and I put it above that one. It wasn't until my hand was about six inches from the top that I finally started to hear panic. I finally started to hear Peter and Emery start to make their way over to where I was until Peter says to her, let's go ahead and circle around. So with knowing that I have a good couple of minutes because they have to go through the building and out the other side, I get to the top, I throw one leg over, and I throw the other leg over, and then I drop. And that drop felt like five fucking years. I'll just never forget landing on my feet and knowing that I was some sort of kitty fugitive at 10 years old. And I started, I started running towards those woods in Washington, D.C. And there's no key word for Act 3 because Act 3 was the rest of my life. Since then, you know, a few weeks later I'd be let out. Six months after that, you know, I'd go to middle school. Several years after that, I'd go to college. A few years after that, I'd get my master's. A couple years after that, I'd go to Korea. And, you know, I, I, I remember, I hear what I had tossed around a lot. I hear people check their doors several times and say, I'm so OCD, I gotta lock my doors twice. I'm so OCD, my mouse pad has to be perpendicular with my computer. I'm so OCD, you know, I have to lift weights at least once away. But the words OCD are not casual like that. They're written in tiles on a sterile floor, and they're written in wire on a dirty fence. And so whenever I hear the words OCD in Monk or in As Good As It Gets or in everything, I always see a wire fence or a tile floor and my life was never the same after that.